Now listen, I have no problem putting my neck on the block for this one. The Star Trek movies are pretty damn near perfect. All right, you've got the Wrath of Khan, which gave you the best villain in the movie franchise. You've got the Voyage Home, which is just pure joy and fun from start to finish. You've got Star Trek First Contact, which reinvents the Borg. Undiscovered Country is a political thriller up in space. You've got Star Trek V, because we need balance. Not every single film is free of mistakes either. I am Sean Ferrick for Trek Culture, and here is the single biggest mistake that each Star Trek movie has made. All right, number 13, let's all drop some LSD. I get it, it was 1979. The world was a different place. I personally was not there for the premiere of this movie. It's been called many things. It's been called the motionless picture. Uh, it's been called boring by its own stars. Now, I think that time has been kind to it, but one scene sticks out like a bit of a sore thumb and it's the wormhole scene. So they needed to show that the Enterprise channels its power through the warp core to fire the phasers, which makes them much more effective, much more powerful. Great, okay. So then they get sucked into a wormhole, then there's a comet, then Decker screams in a sort of a ridiculous manner. Basically the whole scene feels like it's from a different film. So although we love the motion picture here at What Culture, that scene just doesn't really land. Plus the look of shock on Kirk's face when he sees Decker overriding his command. It sort of feels like Kirk's going, who the heck are you to question me? When you really would expect him to kind of have a bit more faith in his executive officer. Number 12 massively overqualified away team. The Wrath of Khan is probably one of the best science fiction movies of the 1980s. Okay, so that's how good we're talking here. So this is, this is small, but, but basically, why the heck was Captain Terrell beaming down to what he thought was SETI Alpha 6? Surely, surely somebody else should have been on that away team with Chekhov. You know, Chekhov is executive officer. Yeah, okay, that makes sense, that's fine. But the captain, isn't there strict guidelines in place that says when a captain Okay, actually, before I even finish that sentence, how many times did Kirk, Picard, Sisko, and Janeway all ignore that rule? It does stick up because also of the direct effect of he gets taken over by Khan and his followers. So listen to the rules next time, buddy. What was that about? Number 11, Boys Club. The entire stealing of the Enterprise scene is one of my favorite scenes in the franchise. I think it's just, uh, it's just pitch perfect. Like go and watch that scene right now. But there is one thing that stands out and it's Uhura's role in the entire theft of the Enterprise. Now, as is depicted in the film, she beams them away. That's it. That's where her involvement in the heist ends. Now the novelization explains this. It says that she worked her way into that role, taking charge of the transporter, that she could then not only beam them to the Enterprise, but also scramble comm traffic as well, so nobody would be able to alert anyone to the theft of the Enterprise. And she was able to scramble the distress call from the Excelsior because she had a personal gripe against Captain Stiles, who she felt robbed Sulu's command from him Thankfully, he would get it a few films later. Then, once they've beamed away, she runs to the Vulcan Embassy and asks for asylum, which Sarek grants. That's brilliant and completely explains why she didn't go with them to Genesis. I just wish that had been in the film. 10. Pollute the past there much, Pavel? Pavel Chekhov is captured by the crew of the Enterprise and is then interrogated. This is time travel and Surely there's there's some sort of guidelines in place about what you can and can't say if you're captured in the past. Potentially, you don't tell them your full name, your rank, your serial number, and the stellar body to which you are a member of. He says he's a commander in Starfleet in the 1980s. This is a big one. And then, okay, completely unintentionally, of course, he takes a fall and ends up in hospital, which leads to more pollution of the timeline when McCoy breaks into the surgery and, you know, fixes him with a wave of his magical McCoy wand. That's fine in a way, 
But then Kirk shoots the door handle with a phaser. That's not to mention the phaser that was left back on the Enterprise. Temporal investigations were very right to be annoyed at the crew of the Enterprise. 9. Are the crew brainwashed or not? Cybok takes control of the Enterprise A with relative ease. Uh, okay, great for the pace of the plot. And he does this by letting the crew express their fears, their pain, and he helps them. And it's, it's sort of assumed that he can exert control over them through this. However, we then see him attempt to do this with McCoy and Spock, both of whom choose not to follow Cybok. So why didn't Chekhov and Uhura choose not to follow Cybok? Kind of can understand why Sulu didn't choose to follow Kirk, although that might be a behind the scenes thing, and Scotty never went through it. So did the entire crew just look for the first opportunity to betray Kirk? Yeah, okay, when you say it like that, actually. Eight, unauthorized phaser levels. The Undiscovered Country is probably my favorite Star Trek film. No disputing the greatness that is Wrath of Khan, but I mean, I Undiscovered Country for me pretty much all the way. However, the unauthorized phaser fire. Valeris demonstrates this in the galley where she vaporizes one of the cooking pots. And it's a cool scene and then the security show up, the alarm go off. Okay, okay, I'm with you. Then later, we find the bodies of crewmen's Yeoman, Burke and Sanno who have been killed with phaser fire at stun at close range. Okay, so is the rule that up to a certain setting, phasers are authorized for use? And if that's the case, who then is allowed to use them? Assume Valeris killed these two men. So if she has authorization to use a phaser, does that stop at a certain level? Does a lieutenant only have authorization to use stun? Can a commander use kill? Can a captain use vaporize? You know, it just, it just introduces that little bit of a question that just niggles in the brain. And also, if such trouble was gone to hide the uniforms, no trouble at all was taken to hide the bodies of these two men. It's just enough just to stick in the brain. Seven, the Enterprise D is a galaxy class starship. Why didn't it do anything? Obviously, behind the scenes, they knew that they weren't going to continue using the TV sets of the Galaxy class ship, and so the Enterprise D was going to bite the bullet in this film. This allowed us to get the beautiful Sovereign class for Star Trek First Contact. However, they chose the method of the Enterprise's destruction to be a 20-year-old D12 class bird of prey. It had a tactical advantage in that they were able to access Geordi's visor and see the shield frequency, which means they could fire straight through the shields. Okay, but in the entire battle, the Enterprise fires like one phaser shot and one torpedo. And that one torpedo destroys the bird of prey. Granted, the shields were down, but still. They are right in saying, Lursa and Bator, that they are no match for a Galaxy-class starship. This particular Galaxy-class starship seemed to forget that. If they had fired a few more weapons, that would have been an equally short battle, but potentially a much more decisive victory for Starfleet. Six, why rely on phasers? One of the best scenes in Star Trek First Contact is when Picard brings Lily to the holodeck. They activate the Dixon Hill program, Picard switches off the safety protocols, and he uses a Tommy gun to go all Scarface all over the two Borg that come in after him. It's great and it's fun. Was there some sort of memory wipe? then when he steps outside the holodeck. The Enterprise-E is full of replicators. Was there no attempt to simply replicate a projectile weapon? We don't know if the TR-116 rifle, for example, existed at this point in time. Let's, let's say that it isn't, okay? Let's say it's not there. Replicate a Tommy gun. Yes, potentially the Borg would be able to adapt, but it's still another weapon. It's another way of fighting them. Then of course, hand-to-hand -hand combat, which obviously nobody really wants to go to with the Borg, but replicate some batlets. It's not relying entirely on the one weapon that they know they will only be able to fire a few shots of. While it does work toward raising the tension of the film, again, a little bit like Star Trek Undiscovered Country, it's just enough just to niggle in the mind afterwards. Five, 
ignoring the Prime Directive. Straight away, let's head this up. Picard calls out Admiral Dougherty on the Prime Directive, to which Dougherty replies, the Prime Directive doesn't apply because these people are not indigenous to the planet. However, before any of that, when the Sonar came to the Federation with this proposal, did no one in the Federation think to do any research on their new allies? One tricorder scan was enough to show that the Baku and the Sona were the same people. And as is depicted in the film, this appears to be news to Admiral Dougherty. It is in fact, or at least it seems to be, the deciding matter for him to stop this dark path he was going down. This is after sending sonar ships after the Enterprise E because he had got himself obsessed with this mission. It's a great scene of the film, but doesn't it go against everything that Starfleet's been set up for? To throw a saving grace at this one, potentially the inclusion of the Allura at the start of the film in the Federation, there is a lot of talk about how quickly Starfleet is attempting to get new allies. However, this seems like a pretty basic check that needed to be done on the sonar. Four, the Remans warrior reputation. Anyone else massively disappointed by the Remans? I actually, I like Star Trek Nemesis. It's like that time has helped it out a little bit here. The Reman Viceroy is brilliant as played by Ron Perlman. He's properly menacing, he's properly scary. Shinzon, of course, isn't Reman. He's a human clone. The other Reman soldiers, they're all said to be some of the fiercest warriors in the galaxy. They were part of the most brutal assaults during the Dominion War, and yet they are just any other cannon fodder in this film. You know, they invade the Enterprise and a single shot from a, you know, a security officer is looking off to the left, still manages to get them. Picard walks through a corridor, phaser rifles, one in each hand, not taking cover, and manages to take down some Reman warriors. It's, it's noticeably bad. Not that I would ever want Riker to lose a fight, but Riker should have lost that fight against the Viceroy. Three, my name is James Tiberius Kirk. Listen, I like this film. I like this film. I like the Kelvin Universe films. They've got great bits. And then they've got this bit. All right, we're supposed to root for this kid. I wanted him to go off the cliff with the car. First of all, he's stealing his uncle's car, little git. Then he drives it off a cliff for no discernible reason that is presented in the film. And then he manages to leap out with an incredibly, incredibly impressive acrobatic feat. And then he finds Robocop in front of him, to which Robocop asks him, what is your name? And he goes, I'm James Tiberius Kirk. And I said, I don't know about you, but if I'm ever presented with anyone asking my name, I'll give them my first and my surname. I've no problem with them knowing my middle name, but I don't shout it at them so much they have to wipe it off their face. It didn't help to feel in any kind of empathy with Kirk. Whereas the very following scene, which has Spock as a child, was brilliant. Two, John Harrison. Just make him John Harrison. Just, just, why did he have to be Khan? I have feelings about this film, all right? I have no problem with reboots or remakes. Sure didn't I just say I enjoyed Trek 09? This is a remake of Wrath of Khan. Whatever else you want to accuse this film of being. And okay, I've no problem with remaking Wrath of Khan, but it was done in a, you know, slipshod, not great kind of way. But also the character of John Harrison was then, as I say, suddenly Khan and, you know, he goes, my name is. On the other side of the glass, you've got, hi, I'm Jim Kirk, this is Spock. Yeah, because they don't know him. It reminds me of, you know, those, when you, whenever you reboot anything, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street, it's like, you know, the music rises as you see the glove. Same with Michael Myers and the mask, you know, things like this. And they are so unnecessary. And also Magic Blood. Can we, can, can we just, Magic Blood. Number one, pretty poor design of a Starbase. Now, straight away, Starbase Yorktown does look beautiful. I love the Christmas globe effect. I think it's really, really cool. However, would you ever put a lock on your aircon? Bral, who technically shouldn't know of the existence of this place, shouldn't know anything about it, and should be 100 years behind the times when it comes to technology, walks into the aircon room injects his little goo and could potentially kill millions of people. This is basic. It's your air supply keeping everyone alive. Put a lock on the door. Maybe have a security guard there. Maybe 
don't leave it in a glass box. You know, these 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 are things. Crawl, there's there's issues with Crawl. Beyond, however, is a great fun film. Except that little bit of Crawl's plan. Now that is it for our list of mistakes. Now, maybe we missed a few. Please feel free to drop them into the comments below. It's good to talk about these things. Exercise our demons. Why did it have to be John Harrison? Why was he Khan? Please don't forget to like, share and subscribe this video. Remember, you can find us over on Twitter at Trek Culture. You can find myself at Sean Ferrick. Whether you spend the next week looking out for movie mistakes or you just enjoy the film for what it is, enjoy it whatever way you do it. Live long and prosper. You're awesome.